The future of New York rides on waves of high water. During Superstorm Sandy, the surge at the tip of Manhattan here crested at 14 feet above normal. That's enough to flood subways and leave thousands homeless and millions without power. The bill for damages will ultimately cost many billions of dollars. Forty countries around the world depend upon seawalls, dikes, and storm surge barriers to protect their people and property. But not so New York. Now there's a new urgency to the big engineering of flood control. City and state officials are looking to innovators worldwide for guidance and inspiration. Even the cities most experienced in building these bulwarks are at a turning point in their struggle for control of nature as the land on which the cities are built continues to sink, populations grow, and the seas around them rise. Spurred by a history of disastrous floods, urban engineers in London, Venice, and the Netherlands have pioneered storm surge barriers and seawalls. Such coastal defenses could well be models for the future in New York and shoreline cities worldwide. But engineers are reaching the limits of conventional flood control measures, and they're looking for new ways to protect low-lying urban waterfronts in face of denser development and conflicting predictions of rising sea levels. To hold back the North Sea, Dutch engineers spent decades and $11 billion to build storm surge barriers, dams, and 1,500 miles of dikes. Called the Delta Works, it costs $2 billion a year to maintain. And to protect against a storm surge in the shipping channel to Rotterdam, Europe's busiest port, engineers built one of the largest moving structures on Earth, a $500 million storm gate in which each swinging arm is as long as the Eiffel Tower is tall. Even so, the more they've drained the land and blocked the water, the more the underlying soil of the Dutch countryside has subsided as it has dried and compressed. And now officials have turned their country into a laboratory of engineering experiments, spending billions more to safely make room for the inevitable floodwaters. The biggest difference with a normal house is this house is floating and we had to experience the last few years that it was floating and that was uh, for us a happy feeling. Here in the Dutch village of Mosbommel, south of Amsterdam, the entire neighborhood rides with the water. The community of 50 amphibious homes was built near the Moss River, known for its seasonal flooding. When the river swells, the houses will float up as much as 18 feet, then float back down again safely as the water subsides. We have here a gray piler that is our anchor. Behind the piler we have flexible pipes that is for the gas, electricity and the cable television. And that is going up when the house is rising. During a flood earlier this year, the water outside Sees Weistdijk's front door was 13 feet deep. The whole garden was filled with water and it was still here on the dike level. But our house was dry and we are safe and there were no problems. The world's second largest movable flood barrier straddles the Thames River downstream of London. Only Rotterdam's is bigger. The barrier has been shut 119 times between when it was opened in 1983 and now uh, and the trend has been up uh, very gradually but largely in line with what was predicted. The massive movable river gates of the $850 million Thames barrier protect central London from storm surge flooding in a region where tides have been rising gradually since the 19th century and the land itself sinking. Scientists say that, like New York, London is slowly tilting downwards. That's because it's adjusting to the melting of the glaciers from the last ice age. At the same time, the tide has been rising. In its first decade of operation, the Thames barrier was closed just four times to block high water. But in the past decade, it has been closed 75 times. 
Already government environmental planners are assessing upgrades and debating proposals for two even larger storm surge barriers on the Thames estuary. The Environment Agency set up the uh, Thames Estuary 2100 project uh, 10 years ago to come up with a plan to manage flood risk from the, uh, the est for the whole of the estuary uh, for the next 100 years to cope with climate change and ageing flood defence infrastructure and increasing development by the river. And we've come up with an adaptable plan that can cope with uh, the worst that climate change is going to throw at us. In Venice, where rising water has forced engineers to raise its center four times in the past 500 years, high water drowned the city again in the fall of 2012. Now engineers are near completion of a $7 billion experiment called the Mose Project. It consists of 78 submersible gates that can be raised to isolate the Venetian lagoon from the Adriatic Sea. Some critics worried the massive project would disrupt the fragile lagoon, disturb precious fisheries, or accelerate the rate at which the city has been sinking. The city considered and then rejected 10 other plans. Mose, they say, is their best hope. Officials hope the gates will be in operation by 2016. In a world of rising tides, though, the sea plays no favorites. Well, we all world cities, coastal cities, face the same risks from rising sea levels and we have to make decisions given our individual circumstances. Uh, we, we've been working with New York and other cities to learn from each other and in New York they face um, the choice of either, either being more resilient to storm surges and or uh, building storm surge protection systems. A low-lying financial district, housing crowding the waterline. One thing urban planners have learned from high water, there are only hard choices. Superstorm Sandy has proved that the problems of London, Rotterdam and Venice are ultimately the problems of New York. For the Wall Street Journal, I'm science writer Robert Lee Hotz.